This is the Wow Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Hello, it's November 2014, and this is your host, Paul Carr. Thank you for joining us on Season 2, Episode 8 of The Wow Signal. And today I have with me James Garrison. Hello. Now you probably remember James from the episode we did with Ast- on Astrobiology. He interviewed Stephen Dick. And our new team member, Tim Jones. Hi, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for having Tim, me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so, well, I'm about the same age as you, I reckon, Paul. Um, I don't have any scientific or professional uh, astronomy or anything, actually, in the way of qualifications. I've spent about, I don't know, the last 10, 15 years online. And about 2004, I started blogging, uh, mostly uh, anthropology, archaeology, and some astronomy. And I came across this podcast uh, a year ago, was it? When you, I'm not sure when you first started uh, broadcasting, and I thought about two years yeah, about ago. Two years ago, I listened to a lot of podcasts um, because I'm at home a lot because of ill health. And the Wow podcast, uh, the Wow Signal podcast, I beg your pardon, uh, struck me as being an excellent podcast, which. Uh, Obviously, I listen to and enjoy a lot. And I saw um, a thing from Paul saying they might need some new co-hosts or whatever. So I wrote in, and much to my surprise, here I am. <laughs> I'm just well, um, I'm uh, I'm glad you're here, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, you know what content you and James and Mike and uh, our other team members come up with over the next sure. few months. The uh, but today's topic is one that we talked about about a year ago. We said we should cover it, uh, which has to do with the risk to Earth from space, the risk to our civilization of getting hit with a big rock. And we have a couple of people that we've interviewed, and very, coming up very soon, we're going to bring in uh, Doctor Jose Luis. Galache, yep, I think that's I pronounced right. that right. Uh, from the Harvard, he's at Harvard. He's at the Minor Planet Center. He's an astronomer, and he'll tell us a lot about asteroids and and sort of setting the record straight. There's a lot of media hysteria every time a little rock passes the Earth, and uh, <laughs> they pay a lot of attention to it, but they don't seem to. They often. Uh, they talk about the huge space. They always use the word huge. <laughs> Even if it's a 10-meter rock, it's a huge rock. A giant boulder. Uh, the giant boulder, yes, uh, that you could fit in your garage, passed, by, passed within a million miles of Earth last night, and we almost all died. You know. Well, I suppose it's um, uh, more serious these days if we do have an impact rather than, say, 100,000 years ago or 2 million years ago because there are so many of us and we live in cities, obviously. And like uh, some of those past um, things like Tunguska or possibly the Younger Dryas vent, if they'd exploded over a modern city, that would be a huge um, amount of destruction, obviously. But would that have um, entered a civilization, do you think? Or just if it... Well, I mean, it, it, we, we don't really know how much damage it takes to destroy our civilization. There's, there's no way to determine that empirically except to destroy our sure. civilization. So. Well, I think some people... <laughs> uh, you'd hard, get a hard time getting that past the ethics committee at a lot of universities. Well, I was, just wanted to quickly add that as long as asteroids, I hear a lot of talk um, that we could get hit, uh, taken out by an X-flare from the sun, for example, which could fry the electric... Uh, grids um, should we be as worried or more worried about that as asteroids or comets or do we lump them all together into well i think that that's that's a very uh reasonable thing to be concerned about 
especially with our electrical grid and the, you know, really never had to deal with that kind of, of major solar flare before. There was an event in Canada a few um, years ago, wasn't there? Um, when it knocked out part of the electric yeah. grid? Well, there was an event in the early 1900s that took out the telegraph lines. That's right, yeah. Yeah, there were people getting That's shot right, by yeah. telegraph lines. We now are, are, are totally dependent on this massive infrastructure of, of high, high voltage lines and uh, it's not entirely clear how vulnerable they are to a really, really big solar flare. The, uh, but there have been some big flares, what they call anomalously large flares. Um, most of them have kind of been a glancing blow. But yeah, it's, that's a realistic thing to worry about. I mean, if, if all of our electricity went out for months, mm -hmm. would that end our civilization? Some people would say it would, you know. Uh, well, we get our water. I'm sure we don't have a lot of... Uh, um, living in cities, yeah. we have our water pumped by electricity, for example. I mean, everything um, seems to run on electric. Yeah. We've been quite a bit of trouble. But now the asteroid risk is a little different. You'd get a lot of local damage, and then you could get sort of damage propagating out from that. And potentially, you know, climactic cooling that could damage agriculture. Sure. Now, as... I think we're about to hear from uh, Dr. Galace that, you know, that, that that kind of very, very large impact is infrequent. But it's going to happen sooner. There's, sooner or later, we're going to be in the crosshairs, one of those uh, you know, mountain-sized asteroids. Um, it may take millions of years, but it'll So I think some people say... Happen. Uh, sorry, Paul, I'll keep interrupting. <laughs> uh, no, that's, no, it's fine. Huh? Go ahead. Uh, some people um, cite that as the reason that we should definitely send uh, humans off into space to inhabit uh, another world or just drift around on an interstellar arc um, because at some point we will get hit by something and we'll need to be somewhere else to carry on. Uh, do you agree with that or is this being a bit far-fetched? I, I think that's a good argument. It's not, to me, it's not the primary motivation. Mm. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the all the eggs in one basket argument I think is... Uh, valid. Mm. I, at this point, we have only one ecosystem we can survive in, and if we want our species to continue, even and, and we know that we know that the planet's not going to last forever. Mm. But now we're talking hundreds of millions of years out. But even just a much shorter time, a few thousand to tens of thousands of years, there are still very serious risks, not just to civilization, but to to our species. Now, what we're talking about today are primarily near-Earth objects, mm. um, but there are a whole bunch of comets out in the Kuiper Belt. Th those we can do very little about. They're not, they don't hit the Earth very often, but... And even if we saw it coming and we, we knew it was on the way, that we just have to sit here and uh, wait, basically. So. Yeah, well, I mean, the problem is, yeah, you wouldn't have much warning, You'd, and it's coming in really fast. What sort of, what sort of speed uh, do they c come in at, then? Oh, they can come in... Um, I mean, Chelyabinsk, for example. 20 kilometers a second or more. And the problem is you don't detect them until they're just a few weeks to a few months out. Uh, because, Yeah, when, when, by the time you, you can late. see it, it, it's too late to do much about it. Uh, these comets are... They can be pretty big. They can be, um, you know... I mean, just a More than a kilometer in size. Uh, we'll, we'll probably... But we could get smacked by something... Uh, in the meantime, you know, well, well, a long time before we have to start worrying about the sun heating up the earth and destroying everything. Dr. Jose Luis Galache received his master's degree in physics at the University of Surrey in the UK in 2002, a PhD in 2006 from the University of Southampton in the UK, was at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics from 2006 to 2009 as a postdoctoral research fellow, and is now at the IAU Minor Planet Center as a staff astronomer. Well, we have with us, um, and I hope I don't mangle this too much, Jose Luis Galache, perfect from the Minor Planet Center, 
asking you just just quickly, um, what is the uh, the mission of the the Minor Planet Center? And is there any difference between a minor planet and an asteroid? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me on the Wow Signal podcast, and I'll be happy to set the record straight on whatever issues you have. Um, so, first of all, let me introduce the Minor Planet Center. We are the world's repository for asteroid observations. So all the astronomers around the world that are making observations of asteroids, they send them to us, and they have been for decades. Uh, we collect them, we analyze them, uh, which means that we figure out the orbits for those observations, and we find out what asteroids for a known asteroid. We just uh, lump those in with the other observations. Uh, very often, we get new asteroids. So under the authority of the International Astronomical Union, we are able to give those asteroids a designation, which is like a license plate, and announce them. And the other important job that we perform is that we coordinate the observations and the follow-up observations of near-Earth asteroids, which are the asteroids that are of most interest, I think, to people because they are in orbits similar to Earth and other ones that might one day impact us. Okay. So um, now is, when you use the term near-Earth asteroid, is there any distinction between that and near-Earth object, or is that the same thing, basically? Well, near-Earth asteroid should refer in theory just to asteroids, while near-Earth object would be asteroids and also comets, uh, oh. although near-Earth comets are a much smaller number. But we're finding out in recent years that objects that we thought were asteroids all of a sudden start to behave like comets. Hmm. And <clears throat> there are asteroids that have comet-like orbits, so we think that maybe they are extinct comets. So the line is becoming a bit blurred, and very often people will say NEA or NEO, interchangeably. I and I should also add that for asteroids, and they're also sometimes referred to as small solar system bodies, which is adding more words and making it even longer <laughs> and more complicated. But I use asteroid because that is what everyone uses and it's what they are. Right. Um, now, how about how many asteroids are discovered every year? Well, that number just keeps going up and up. When Space Watch began here in the U.S., it was the first uh, official survey uh, funded by NASA to find near-Earth objects. And r right now, we've just surpassed last year, which was around 1,100 asteroids. So I think this year we're going to find about 12,500 near-Earth asteroids. Hmm. Now, That's a that, lot of asteroids. <laughs> yeah. Of that population, uh, okay, how many of those are, are near-Earth Roughly. No, so the, those 1,200 or so will be near Earth. So um, most, most of them. And all of them, are, all of those are near Earth. Um, if you're talking about asteroids in general, yes. then we've, uh, what is the number? Something like 20,000 asteroids a year anywhere in the solar system. Hmm. So I did the calculation. It's roughly about every 11 minutes or something like that. Um, oh. We find an asteroid somewhere in the solar system. Wow. Um, so, real question what would define an object as being near Earth that is a good question we're talking about them and we haven't <laughs> defined them uh, basically it's an object that has a perihelium distance of less than 1.3 astronomical units so let me define that <laughs> <laughs> it means that it's as close to the sun as 1.3 times the average distance from the Earth to the sun that makes sense? Yes. Yeah. It's about 120. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, now, um, of the population of near Earth or objects or near Earth asteroids that are out there, uh, round numbers statistically, uh, do we think there's still a lot of unknown objects? Oh, yes. Definitely. Uh, the, the population that we expect, it well, depends where you want to stop counting, how small you go. <clears throat> Just like if you go to a beach and you find that there are a few boulders, many more stones, lots of pebbles and a gazillion um, bits of sand, then that's more or less the same as what happens with asteroids. 
So we have not that many big ones and many, many little ones. So if we look at, say, the population down to 100 meters, so that's 100 meters and larger, we estimate that there are about 20,500 and we have found about 6,000 of those. So we're still missing 14,500. Hmm. And is, is 100 meters a good, a good uh, threshold for where the asteroid is uh, considered hazardous? Or is that simply just um, what we can see? It, it's a nice round number. <laughs> and we used to think that, that that meant that it was... It could be very, very dangerous, but as the asteroid cool. impact in Russia last year showed, even an object as small as 17 meters can cause damage on the ground. So an object that's maybe 25 meters could potentially explode lower than the one in Russia and maybe cause even more devastation. Hmm. So really... If we start counting, say, at 20 meters, and I actually looked this up and wrote it down, um, so object as many as 17 million. 17 million? In near-Earth space, yes. Wow. Yes. Now, and, and we only know of, uh, of a tiny <coughs> fraction of the total. That... Yes, of those we know of. I haven't actually counted, but probably around 100 or something like that, maybe 200. 100, 120 million miles. The, uh, now, here's a chance to set the record straight. Uh, of the near-Earth objects uh, that are out there about 120. Are yeah. large enough to be hazardous, okay. are there any that w are known to, uh, to be likely to hit the Earth at, at any time in the future? The Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena maintains a list of dangerous objects or possibly dangerous objects and they don't have anything tabulated for the near future. There, there are objects on the list which we're keeping a lookout for, which um, more observations are made of. And generally what happens is that as more observations are taken, the orbit is refined and improved and then that's a way. At, at the moment, there are a handful of objects that have very, very, very small probability of impact a few decades into the future. But yeah, it's no. nothing that has a definite probability now, any time. If I look on JPL's future. website, they say there are currently 1,512 known potentially hazardous asteroids, but none of those have a high probability of striking the Earth. But the key word there is potentially, mm -hmm. not hazardous. It means that they come close enough to Earth that maybe at some point in the future, and this may be millions of years, uh, their orbits will be perturbed enough that they could become a hazard. And none of them are actually currently hazardous. Okay. Uh, now, if, if we do find one that's hazardous, uh, who's in charge? Is, is it NASA? Is it the Minor Planet Center? Uh, <laughs> Who, who decides what to do? Well, if we discover a new one that's nice. going to impact within a few weeks, the Minor Planet Center will be the first people to know about that. <laughs> but uh, deciding what to do, in theory, it's going to be a world problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll figure out where it's going to hit, and it's going to be in a particular country. But really, this is a world problem. And the United Nations has recommended the creation of a group called IWAN, uh, the initials for International Asteroid Warning Network, of which the Minor Planet Center is a part of. And the work that we're doing is to uh, figure out the best way to communicate the risks or the current hazard. And should we ever discover one that is on an impact trajectory, to uh, maintain open channel communications with interested people which I imagine would be everybody in the world, mm -hmm. so that the correct yeah. information can be out there. And then, which, let me see, if I remember, the Space Missions Program Advisory Group, I believe, who are going to be in charge of studying possible methods of deflection or destruction, because there is no 
well made in which to move an asteroid because asteroids can be of different sizes, different compositions. Um, they may be solid or they may be amalgamations of uh, smaller bits. So depending on what the asteroid is made of, we have to find a specific mission for it. So when we give and when we do discover this asteroid, uh, same page would be charted with figuring out what to do about it. And then who's going to take care of it? Well, we hope that the nations of the Earth come together, especially the ones with space programs, and they can collaborate to uh, develop a mission and we can go out there and stop the beast. I was just going to ask you a quick question. Are we on Earth somewhat protected by the fact we've got lots of oceans? Well, yeah, statistically, yes. Uh, 70% of the Earth are oceans. Mm -hmm. So you'd expect 70% of asteroids to hit the sea. Now, if we're talking of a sizable object like 100 meters, if it hits the sea, it is going to create a tsunami. Sure. So it, it's still going to be a danger to the coastal areas surrounding the ocean where it hits. But what does most for our protection is the atmosphere. Because mm. objects uh, 10 to 15 meters or so, uh, maybe even bigger, will not actually make it through the atmosphere. And we see this in Mars, for example, whose atmosphere is something like a thousand times thinner than Earth. Mm. Now, let, let's talk about a, a meteor that was in the news recently, uh, the Chelyabinsk, uh, which you've already mentioned uh, was that a complete surprise? Did did the Minor Planet Center have any idea it was coming, or did it just hit? Uh, no, no, nobody knew it was coming. And it wasn't because nobody was looking, but because nobody could look. Because it came from the morning sky, so basically from the, the, the sun. And telescopes on Earth can only look at the night side of Earth. So... They, can, they look away from the sun. They can't look towards the sun. So there was no way we could have seen it. And it was too small to have been seen on a previous pass close to Earth. Mm -hmm. And... No, go, go ahead, James. Go ahead. It's not really practical. The problem with your own signal, your radar wave that then bounces on the object and comes back. So you need a very high power radar to be able to do that. And they use, for example, Arecibo and uh, Goldstone, which is in California. And these very large disks uh, with a lot of power. And because they're targeting asteroids that are many hundreds of thousands, even millions of kilometers out, uh, they can. They have to concentrate the beam, which means that they can only point at a very tiny spot in the sky. The, there, there is there is a nonprofit group uh, called the B612 Foundation that are proposing putting a space telescope in a Venus-like orbit. W would that help with the detection of those uh, sunward asteroids? Well, in principle, any telescope in space is going to help, especially the infrared. Uh, right now we have the WISE telescope, which has a specific NEO mission, so that it's called NEO-WISE, and they found a number of near-Earth objects. As far as going to Venus orbit, it's not really necessary, because if you stay in Earth orbit, you have the advantage that you can download all the, the complete data sets, so the images that the telescope has taken and then analyze them on the ground. The problem with going to Venus orbit is that because the telescope is going to be far away from Earth uh, for a high percentage of its mission, and everything has to be analyzed on board where there is reduced computer capacity. So if you miss any objects that are uh, studied on board, then you've missed them forever. While if you have that data on the ground, you can keep on reanalyzing it as your methods improve and your algorithms get better. But in any case, a space telescope uh, can and should help, but they can't point towards the sun either. But they can definitely point a lot closer to the sun than you can point from a telescope on the ground. Right. So your answer is neither a yes or a no. <laughs> it can help, <laughs> but there are still objects that, even with the space telescope, could sneak up on us. Mm -hmm. So what... What do you think we need to do that we're not doing now to detect hazardous objects? 
Um, well, a space telescope would definitely help. Uh, that's for sure. Um, right now we have two main surveys on the ground, which is the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona and the Pan-STARRS Survey in Hawaii. And it is covering 5 or 96% of all the near-Earth asteroids. Um, what we don't have is a telescope surveying in the southern skies. So that means the southern 30%, southernmost 30% of the sky, any near-Earth asteroids passing through there are going to be missed. So we have to wait until they come around again in the northern hemisphere. Uh, but if we keep on doing what we're doing, we will eventually discover all the potentially hazardous asteroids. The question is, how quickly do we want to discover them? So at the current rate, it's probably going to take at least a decade, probably more. If we want to discover them sooner, then we're going to need the help of um, an infrared space telescope. I see. And uh, <clears throat> the... Uh do you think that, um, so you, you think we might, we might actually have a complete list in about a decade just using the equipment we ha that we currently have? Or is, is it, would, it, would it be, uh, it's, not, it's not a population that's growing, is it? Or not growing fast, anyway. Well, uh, the, the modeling right now suggests that it's, it's a steady state. So we lose some that fall into the sun, will get ejected out of the solar system, and at the same time, we're getting new members injected from the, the asteroid belt. But it's a slow process. I see. Um, now, uh, the uh, asteroid mining efforts, such as uh, what Planetary Resources is up to, prospecting for asteroids, will that help us find NEOs? Um, I think we're expecting that NASA is going to find them and they will use that information a little bit like the mining companies might use data from the uh, U.S. Geological Survey mm -hmm. to see where they are That's how I think they're thinking. And you have to think that they're going to send out probes. They're going to have to be small and cheap. So they're not going to big telescopes or anything like that. I see. So I don't think they're likely to discover any meaningful numbers of asteroids. Mm -hmm. um, the but, Earth sometimes acquires temporary moons, according to some recent research. Can we detect those? And can we plan a mission yes. to study those? So right now, only one of them has been detected. Uh, it was discovered in 2006. Uh, but depending, I know there are two groups that have been looking at this, uh, Mikhail Grafnik and Stephen Kortenkamp. And their numbers differ a little bit. They both agree that at any given time, there's probably one temporary moon captured temporarily by the Earth. Meanwhile, um, Steve Corton Kemp calculates it should be a 10-meter moon. And I actually went to a talk of his last week at a large conference, annual concern all the planetary scientists in the U.S. go to. And I think the number he gave is that he expects at any time for there to be something like four one-meters temporary interesting animations based on his calculations. Uh, but he, I spoke to him and he said that it, they're difficult to find because they move very slowly with respect to Earth. And the current surveys that are looking for near-Earth asteroids look for objects that move quite fast in the sky. Hmm. So you'd have to fine-tune your search if you want to find these temporary moons. They actually, in the sky, they, they move, move slower than the main belt asteroids. Main belt asteroids. Um, I presume you've heard of the Younger Dryas uh, comet theory that supposedly killed off the culture and wiped out sort of the megafauna of uh, North America. And some people are saying, yep, there was definitely comets. We found the nano diamonds and the spher spherules. And other people say, 
Maybe we haven't found anything at all and there's no way for it. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, unfortunately, not being an impact expert, I I don't really side either way. I have um, mm. read in the past a little bit about this and it seems like, to me, it seems like it's still up for debate. But yeah. apparently not. I think this is the game that science plays so often where mm-hmm. you find there's nothing definitive and yeah. different people will look at the evidence in different ways and and uh, come to arrive at different conclusions. Uh, but I think also there is a preconception that you hear all the time saying nobody has ever been killed by it. And, and I wonder if hearing that too often leads scientists to think, well, nobody has ever been killed by an asteroid, therefore this cannot be an asteroid impact. Was Tunguska a similar kind of thing to that, do you think? Or that's a big mystery, isn't it? Sorry, you were breaking up again. You were asking something about Tunguska? Yeah. Yeah. I was just asking if you thought uh, Tunguska may have been a similar kind of event to North America, if indeed that was a real event. Um, that's a big mystery as well, isn't it? They haven't found any debris from a comet or anything. Well, I think Tunguska, from what everything I've read, does seem to be almost certainly an asteroid. I know there's been the big debate whether it's a comet or an asteroid. Mm-hmm. Um, given the the field of destruction, the shape, it seems to coincide with what you would expect from a pretty cohesive asteroid. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's talk about the broader question of existential risk to Earth from space uh, collisions. What do you think the best estimates are that... Uh, humanity will dodge the bullet, that we'll never have to deal with a, a really civilization-threatening collision? Or is it almost a certainty over a long enough period of time? It is definitely a question of when and not if. So if we're going to be here probably another 100 million years then as a civilization, then we will most likely have to deal with Civilization, civilization ending impact. Uh, we have average numbers that we estimate from our current models and knowledge. So something like what killed the dinosaurs, we expect to only hit every 100 million years. Okay. Something like so that, hit, that hit um, that hit Russia last year, we expect to be every 100 or 200 years. But that's an average. So that doesn't mean that we might not get hit by another one right. next week, right. just on, on average. Uh, not yeah. Sorry, okay, anybody else have any other questions one. for uh, Jose? Uh, one? Uh, not off the uh, Sorry, somebody else. Uh, in, Mike, do you have a protocol for anything we can do now in order to... to Effect an asteroid strike, <laughs> or we just kind of stuck watching it come at us. So, so you're you're saying, uh, is there anything we can do now to, if we if we saw an asteroid coming at us, what could we do anything now? Is that your is that your question? With current technology. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've heard a few theories of. Putting rockets on there, paintballing them, but nothing solid yet. Yeah, I, I think we do know more or less what we have to do, and, and there is technology for a lot of it. The first thing we need to know is the asteroid itself, um, how large it is, what it's made out of, if it's a solid piece, if it's two chunks, if it's many more chunks, and really that would be. Uh, decides on what mission we launch, what type of mission. The thing we probably wouldn't do is what we did in Armageddon. So we wouldn't send a bunch of deep sea miners out to put a nuclear device inside the asteroid. Mm -hmm. That's probably what we wouldn't do. But yes, there are... Sorry? Did any other question about deep sea people? Okay. Uh, I... I think that uh, that's all our questions for now. I I, uh, um, 
hopefully we won't have to call you back anytime soon and ask you what that thing is headed for us. But <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Not, Dr. Jose Luis Gal- Galache for joining us on uh, the Wow Signal podcast. Thank you, Paul, for uh, struggling through my survey. And I'll send you a link shortly when uh, this comes out. Okay. Thank you. And feel free to get in touch with me if we do find one that's coming towards us. I'll be happy to chat with you guys. (laughs) As you can no doubt hear, we are experimenting with a new process for recording the podcast. This is responsible for the uneven audio quality that you just heard. I apologize for that. We will get it better. The This is all in the interest of not only recording the podcast better and recording better podcasts, but also recording more frequent podcasts. So it's in everyone's interest, and I hope you'll bear with us. And now we have Duncan Lennon. You, you, if you listen to episode five of season two, about three episodes ago, you have met Duncan Lunan in the discussion of the long delay echoes. Duncan Lunan is a graduate of Glasgow University in Scotland. He has a postgraduate diploma in education. He's a full time author and speaker with emphasis on astronomy, spaceflight, and science fiction. In 2013, he published the book Incoming Asteroid What Can We Do About It? And we've taken the title for this episode from that book. So here's Duncan Lunan to talk about incoming asteroid. But I'd like to move on to the topic of uh, planetary defense and Jeez. your book. Um, which I've not had. I don't have a copy of. I'm afraid. I did. I did get that summary that you sent. Uh, it's called "Incoming Asteroid." One of the questions that that first pops up. We know that there's lots of. Uh, there's actually, I think, over a thousand what so-called potentially hazardous asteroids out there. At present, we don't know of any one that's certainly going to hit the Earth at any future time. Mm-hmm. Um, but. It it is possible that in any given day, uh, we could get we could, an astronomers could say, well, there's some probability, right? They'll never tell us it's certain. They'll say, with some probability, greater than some frightening threshold, <laughs> uh, this thing is going to hit the Earth, and it, and it now. Most of the ones we know of are are fairly small, uh, but still big enough to do a lot of damage. Um, so, in your in your research, did you find that there could be uh, what what what's the biggest asteroid that we might not have detected yet, that, and how much damage could it do to the Earth? Uh, very hard, very hard to say. We, we know it's now reckoned that um, something like the last figure I saw was um, ni- approaching ninety five percent of the estimated population of potentially hazardous asteroids. Have now have now been located, and as you say, there's no there's no immediate hazard. And where I ended the book was uh, in saying that you know comparing how the picture has altered over the last forty years and saying how very lucky we have apparently been that um, not only is there um, not only has nothing hit us, but nothing looks likely to hit us before we have time to develop the means to do something about it. But the, the scenario of the book was proposed by uh, a friend of mine called Bill Ramsey back in 2002 as a discussion project which continued over the next 10 years. Um, and the question he laid before the, the group called Astra that I was involved in then was if we knew there was going to be an impact, if we knew there was going to be an impact in 10 years' time, what could we do? And what would we do? Um, now, when we when we tackled this, we realised that in order to address the question, 
what we what we needed basically was a a designer hazard, um, an object which what the re reason Bill had said ten years was that it was a slightly longer than the time scale for Project Apollo. It was time in which something could something could be done, but it wasn't so long that governments could say we'll leave it to our successors to deal with. Action would be required, starting pretty well immediately, and so. What we had to do was postulate a hazard which would not be too big or too hard, um, that it would be beyond present technology to deflect, uh, and not too easy, not a dust ball that would just fly apart if we if, if we hit it with something. Um, so, it would, but it would have to be in an orbit that wasn't too um, too hard or too easy to get to. And um, from the from these and other considerations, we end we ended up designing an asteroid which was spherical, uh, uh, made of rock, uh, uh, a chondrite, um, a, a kilometer in diameter, uh, enough enough to pose a really major challenge, but not not insuperable. And then we worked out, uh, and in an orbit which would allow uh, two attempts at deflection before the final approach on which desperate measures might be might be tried. So we worked out a detailed plan for uh, an unmanned mission which would use solar collectors to, to try to deflect the, the asteroid and a manned mission which would use a combination of mass driver and gravity tractor techniques. And if that failed, then you resort to nuclear devices kinetic impactors, the more desperate types of measure. Um, and if all of that fails, um, the late Dr. Arthur Hodkin, an environmental consultant, gave us a detailed scenario on how, with 10 years notice, you could do an enormous amount to alleviate the loss of life. And then we looked and turned out what you could do with all this lovely new space technology if you did succeed in deflecting the asteroid. And then the final chapter of the book is reporting on the tremendous breakthroughs that have been made in space cooperation in the last year on this, on this topic as a result of the previous 14 years of deliberation by the UN Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. I'm, I'm astonished that the agreements reached by the General Assembly late last year have not, not made headlines. It's, I think it's a, a huge breakthrough in space cooperation. And so that essentially is the, the content of the book. Do you think we're doing enough now to detect these hazardous asteroids and plot their trajectories? Nothing like enough. Um, there is still, in Britain, for example, at government level, there is an attitude that the United States is doing everything that needs to be done, so we'd, we don't need to, and it's, it's not like that. We need... Uh, the, there is still no dedicated observatory looking for hazardous objects outside the United States. There will be shortly. The Space Guard UK Observatory in Wales is in the process of acquiring that capability now. They've, they've been donated a um, very large Schmidt camera from, from Cambridge University, which they're in the process of in, installing at the, the Welsh Observatory, and it, it will be very much in expanding the cap capacity they have at the moment. That still leaves gaps uh, around the world as it turns on its axis, swathes of sky that are not being not being scanned. And the Southern Hemisphere search, which was being run by an old friend of mine uh, called Robert McNaught at Siding Spring in Australia, has been stopped altogether. The Australian government's withdrawn the funding, and at the moment there is no watch for hazardous objects being conducted. Yes, I was going to say, Wales can't see the Southern Hemisphere very well, so... Yeah. <laughs> and the further, as far as I'm aware, the further sight you've got is Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a big... Uh, there are plans. Uh, the uh, B612 Foundation has its its proposed um, sentinel, sentinel satellites, which they're going to put in the, in the orbit of Venus to, to scan the whole sky from different, a different direction. And... Um, you know, the, 
that and ideas like it will enormously increase what can be done. But at the moment, nothing like enough is being done. I understand. Um, and uh, <clears throat> now, if we do detect one, we are, uh, it will be a while before we're certain it's going to hit the Earth, correct? Well, again, for our scenario, we had to be, we had to be certain. If, if it's in an orbit um, which generates recurring encounters with the Earth, on the past before, the, the close past before the impact, it will go through what's called the keyhole, which is a fa fairly narrow region of space, which it has to go through if it's going to hit next time. Um, observations at that point will generate an error ellipse, as you were, as you were saying er earlier. Um, within which the Earth would be would be found, and that would that would ra raise the alarm. For our for our scenario, we assumed that the error ellipse is actually smaller than the diameter of the Earth, and we it's virtually certain it's going to hit, which tells you that it must have been monitored by radar at the point when it went through the keyhole, which tells you that it must have come from outside of the Earth's orbit and been detected on approach optically so that the radar scan could be set up. So it tells you a lot about the orbit that our Goldilocks hazard has to have. I see. Now, we wouldn't know at that point, uh, would we, exactly where it was going to hit. We would just know somewhere on the Earth, right? Well, we, we, know, which he we know which hemisphere, which gets you into the whole interesting question of the deflection dilemma and the the red line, a topic Rusty Schweikart is speaks about quite a lot. His, his his fear is that in that situation, different nations might start trying to push the thing in different directions, away from themselves and towards one another. And you could <laughs> end up end up with an awful situation where everybody's efforts cancelled out. So we 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 were proposing an international program from the outset, which the initiatives that have now been passed by the United Nations, put together by a team led by Professor Richard Crowther at Oxford, who seems to me to have done a terrific job here. Um, the international agreements are now in place for on ongo ongoing, ongoing watches and the development of strategies to deal with a hazard if it's found. Um, I, this is a very big forward step. Mm. Uh, they could um, they could save a year or more of argument if the if the crisis does arise. Well, let's talk about some of the uh, mitigation techniques that you uh, deflection techniques that you discuss in your book. Uh, why not try nukes first? Why not try hitting it first? Um, Wouldn't that be simpler? Well, will it work at all? That is, ah. that is the question. You lose a lot of time if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, there are there's also the question of what if you what if you shatter it? Um, as as J. Tate of Space Camp says, you've turned a cannonball into a, a um, you know a, a musket volley or or worse. Um, it could be uh, you could create a far worse situation by 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 shattering it if you overdid the nuke. What you want is some is gentle, slow, cautious, bit by bit mod modification of the orbit. Um, and not not one big bang that may or may not work and could make things worse. Um, there's also the question: if it does turn out, you have to send people there. Do you really want to irradiate it first? Uh, they're going to have enough to contend with without <laughs> having a big radioactive patch on the side of it. Right, I see. So that would uh, we don't even know that a nuke would would deflect it sufficiently then. Yeah. There are there are scientists who believe that, that this is the answer. Um, Zaitsev and the uh, former Soviet Union believe believed this was this was the way to do it. But he he was thinking primarily in terms of really fragile objects, dust balls that you could completely disintegrate. But uh, Nigel Holloway in the in the UK did a lot of, a lot of work on ways to deflect that. Uh, Asteroids with with nukes, and he he still believes it's the answer. Last I last I heard, and he was kind enough to let us use his figures. This, this wouldn't actually, you wouldn't use the nuke to destroy the asteroid so much. You'd use it to create a hot spot on one side of that. That's that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, 
which if you don't yet know what its, what its composition is or, or its structure, um, strikes me as taking an awful chance in, in starting with that. We, we saw that as uh, one of the last, last ditch measures. Nigel, Nigel Holloway told us that you could you could deflect an asteroid of that size with a year to, a year short of impact. So I would say that was that was probably the time to try it. If you if you go if ever, if, if if all else has failed. Um, now, uh, what did you think was the most promising approach for deflecting a, a threatening a hazardous asteroid? Well, initially, initially, I thought that. By by far the best idea was the one which my colleague Gordon Ross of the Industrial Design Unit at Glasgow School of Art had put forward in the 1980s, which was to send out one or more parabolic solar sails and um, use an, an array of flight, uh, adaptive optics, flexible mirrors, to to focus sunlight onto the, the asteroid and create a jet. And controlled conditions, which you could you could modify, turn on and off, and mm. you know gen- generally proceed slowly and cautiously. I see. Uh, now that I- that idea has gone a lot further. We shared it with Dr. Max Vasili at Glasgow, then at Glasgow University, now South Clyde, and he has taken it a, a lot further, and he has decided that um, using solar powered lasers. Is a better idea than than doing it all with mirrors. Hmm. So, um, yeah, there's a great deal to be said for that. Um, but we're in agreement with Max's group that if that one doesn't work, mass drivers and gravity tractor are the, are the next best bet. So that that was our second scenario, mm-hmm. using you, you, using manned spacecraft and. Well, I mean, I know it cost a lot of money, but do you think it'd be worthwhile to? do a practice run on a harmless asteroid. I think it would be an excellent idea. I, I noticed that the, um, uh, yeah, um, at the recent uh, planetary defense conference that uh, a lot of people were, were saying, you know, we really need to practice this. We, we, we need to try out the different techniques. Um, and uh, yes, I, th- I think it's a very good idea. I think, uh, NASA's plan to bring an asteroid into orbit around the moon uh, is a very good one from this point of view. Um, we can we can practice we can practice small with that one because right. uh, you know, it'll 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 be there for a, for several years and we can try out a number of things on a small scale. And it'll be a relatively small asteroid, probably. Yeah, yeah. They're talking they're talking about um, something about ten meters across. I understand. Yeah. Um, and my, my uh, Colin McInnes, who's doing a lot of the orbital calculations for this, is um, he's another one who's shared his ideas with us in the in the book. Um, he's particularly into kinetic deflection. He thinks he thinks that's the answer that you basically fire cannonballs at it. So you hit it with something, and yeah, yeah. Um, which is kind of like the opposite of a mass driver. <laughs> well, the. His idea was that you would take your large kinetic impactor mm-hmm. into orbit around the sun and with a, a solar sail and over a period of years shift it into a retrograde orbit so that mm-hmm. it would hit, hit the asteroid with max, maximum impact. But um, Graham Dale of the, of the Mars Society said, wouldn't it be better to build a, a, a big mass driver in, in Earth orbit or lunar orbit and then you could use smaller projectiles, and you could do the things more slowly and carefully uh, with multiple hits. And so we thought, if we've got our fleet of ships out at the asteroid who have tried and failed with the mass driver and the gravity tractor, they can stand off from it, and they can provide final, final guidance for those impacts. And then uh, Andy Nimmo of the Space Settlers Society said, if you've got this mass driver in there orbiting in the Earth-Moon system, you're going to need a lot of solar power to to energize it. Mm-hmm. What about using a high-energy laser? And I discovered that at the University of Santa Barbara, there's a, a group working on a project called D-Star, where they're they're modeling doing exactly that. And they were kind enough to let me use their figures in the book. So we'd have 
all of these things to try uh, in the last year. And if they all fail, then the quotation I've put in uh, Robert, from Robert Burns at that point goes, now all is done that men can do and all is done in vain. <laughs> and then you, then you come down to getting the peoples into the shelters, as Arthur Hodgkins suggested. And yeah. remarkably enough, he reckoned you could cut the death toll by 90%. If you had ten years' notice and you made adequate provision, and what's what's worse, a uh, land impact or a uh, a sea impact? Sea impact, certainly without warning, would be worse, far worse. But J. Tate pointed out there are special circumstances here. There are parts of the ocean that are deeper than five five kilometers, five even deeper than five miles. If you could deflect the object just enough for that, and we're talking about a one-kilometre object, then the crater won't reach the seafloor. The environmental effects of tsunamis and storms will be very bad, but you won't you won't get the you won't get the dust thrown up. You you won't get the nuclear winter. Um, and so, if you've got ten years, you can evacuate the coasts. And the thought of evacuating the coasts all around the Pacific Rim is a pretty fearful task, but uh, with sufficient determination, it could be done. Well, that. that's your only hope of survival. You'll, you'll find a way to do it. Yeah, it, there, there are billions of people living around those coasts, but given the given at present, we're primarily dealing with paper designs and paper uh, solutions to planetary defense. What do you think is the next step? Where should we go? Where should we go as, as a planet? Mm -hmm. where, where do we go? Well, I think the first thing, which has been missing ever ever since the the days of Project Apollo, is to get a a, a heavy lift booster, uh, the equivalent capacity capacity to Saturn V, back it back on online, av available for big programs if we have to run them. Uh, Russia had its Energia booster at the the end of the nineteen eighties. Um, but that didn't, didn't survive the collapse of the Soviet Union. It could presumably be regenerated if you had a 10-year ten, ten timescale. But at the moment, the space launch system is the, the thing that you know, we're looking at, saying, well, this is going to give, give us that capability back. It means we can put people on, on, on the moon again, and we can go to Mars if we, if we wish to, and we can do the asteroid rendezvous that NASA, Obama has de, directed NASA to do. Um, but it will give us the the capability of doing all kinds of things in space, which at the moment we don't have. And um, I I'm, I'm really hope that this, this goes through and becomes a success. I see. Um, beyond that, as we previously said, yes, def definitely uh, much, much more of keep watching the skies. <laughs> <laughs> let's, be, let's be certain of, of what we can do. Well, that, that's a... That's a Relatively low cost and high, high payoff uh, approach. There, uh, I think that it's it's such an obvious thing to do that I'm not sure why there isn't more being done. But uh, mm. yes, as, as JT keeps saying, you know, they, to to do it on a global scale would cost about as much as much as a squadron of uh, come fighter bombers. Yeah. Oh. Probably less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and to 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 do the to get the to get the Schmidt telescope set up at Space Guard UK, um, it's going to cost roughly as much as a new Range Rover. Um, now this is this, he's not in a position to buy a new Range Rover, but he <laughs> he has through sheer determination managed to raise about three quarters of the funding. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, a percentage a percentage of the proceeds of my book is going to that. Yes, so, oh, uh, help to save the earth by the by the book. And the B six twelve Foundation is uh, largely raising their money through private uh, donations. So that's yeah. that's uh, it. That may be the way we go in the future. We may just everybody on the planet who cares about it. Sends a, sends a check. <laughs> yeah. Well, when the when the combined gross natu national product gets uh, gets big enough, as as, Fre as Freeman Dyson said back uh, years ago now, um, when the when 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 the world becomes sufficiently prosperous, the first the first starship may be built by Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, uh, it could be that way. <laughs> I'd like to thank Duncan Lunan and Jose Luis Galache for informing us about what the asteroid threat is, what it isn't, why it's important, but also helping us get in some perspective and perhaps cut through the media hype and all the talk about huge boulders swinging right by the Earth. Um, I hope the next time you hear a media report, you'll have a bit more perspective, and a bit more of a balanced view and understand what they're talking about. The importance of this topic is high. I agree with Duncan Lunan that we're not doing enough for surveillance, um, and I think we could do more for very, very little investment compared to, as he pointed out, a squadron of fighter bombers. The B612 Foundation is also... Uh, a private voluntary organization that is um, one of the, headed up by some former astronauts like Rusty Schweiker, Ned Liu, and they are doing important work in this area. I hope to have them on soon to tell us about the Sentinel mission and why it's important and why we need to understand the asteroid threat. And also, people from the asteroid mining community I, can help us understand this better as well. Also, we want to hear from you. We'd like you to join the conversation. There are lots of ways to contact us and to get into a discussion with us. You can go to the blog and make a comment at wowsignalpodcast.com. You can go to our subreddit, the Wow Signal Podcast subreddit. You can go to our Google Plus community. We even have a Facebook page, uh, which is not very busy at the moment, but I'd love to see some more traffic there as well. You can also email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. We'd like your feedback on this episode and others. We'd like to know who you think we should have on in the future and what topics we should cover. If you want to help support this podcast, go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com, slash wowsignal, and you can contribute per episode. And along those lines, I'm very happy to report that we have our very first patron, Stephen Fernandez, who has pledged per episode to the Wow Signal podcast. And thank you very much, Stephen. You are our first patron. I hope you are nowhere near our last. So you're the pioneer. And Stephen, uh, send me your snail mail address and I'll get you a T-shirt or a coffee cup or whatever it is you, you like. And I will thank anyone on air who supports us on Patreon. Also, um, please subscribe to the podcast. That way you'll get all the updates right away. It's free. We will never charge you for the podcast, and we'll never have any advertising on the podcast, except for these little begging segments where we... One other little announcement. We've begun a new format for the WOW Signal, In addition to these longer episodes like we've just had, we're going to have something called the Wow Signal Bursts. We've already had our first one. It was Mike Mongo discussing his book, The Astronaut Instruction Manual for Preteens. And there will be a number of these. that They'll be five to ten minutes. They'll be largely without fanfare, not a lot of of show notes or music, just uh, a quick very focused discussion of a single topic by one of the team members or possibly a a very short interview. The burst uh, will be on the same feed as the regular podcast, but they'll be numbered separately. So keep an eye out for them. So that's it for season two, episode eight of the wow signal. I'd like to thank our guests again, uh, J.L. Galache and Duncan Lunan. I'd like to thank my panel, Tim Jones, our new team member on the WOW Signal, and James Garrison. Once again, I'd also like to thank our patron, Stephen Fernandez, and I'd like to thank our musicians, DJ Spooky, 
Jason Robinson, and Erica Lloyd. Here's Erica Lloyd's song, Fulfill. Since with the asteroid threat, something isn't right here, I thought that the chorus of the song would fit in just right. So here's Erica Lloyd with her song, Fulfill. I'll give you what you want tonight Take it or leave it Your body has to hold its right To get back some feeling But how can I fulfill What wasn't there to begin This has been The Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.